thank you all for tuning in to the first of this season's Lunch and Learns. This is something that we started doing in our building on the Stonington waterfront a few summers ago. And uh, we pivoted to a virtual platform last summer and with such success that we're able to kind of reach an audience far and wide, we have uh, planned a series of seminars, virtual seminars to take us through this late winter and early spring. So um, the first here is the sweet and the salty of the Maine sea scallop fishery. And uh, I am Dr. Carla Gunther, the chief scientist here at the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. And um, I'm joined with Melissa Smith, the resource manager of Maine's Department of Marine Resources, and um, Amber Lisi, the scallop biologist at the department. And uh, hopefully David Tarr will be joining us. I think he may be trying to tune in from his boat. He is both a scallop dragger and a scallop diver. And he and I both sit on the Scallop Advisory Council together. And then uh, Tog Braun, who is a former uh, resource manager for the Maine Department of Marine Resources. And she was so um, enamored with the quality of the product here in Maine, she has gone out on her own as uh, Maine day boat scallops and a seafood purveyor. So thank you all for joining us. And um, so let's kick it off. Um, up first is Melissa Smith. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me just two screens here. So I need to just finagle one screen to one computer and then the other for my slides. So um, this is uh, a little nerve wracking for me because and in my world, um, we still refer to Tog, um, who has held my position previously and will, will, will definitely remember some of the information that I'll be discussing today. Um, she is our scallop queen. And um, in the federal circuit, that's, that's the nickname that we have given her because of her uh, championing for Maine harvesters in the federal fishery and also in the state fishery for the product and the fishery that we support here in the state of Maine. So Tog, I will do my best to, uh, you know, be that person that has taken over your role and the fantastic job that you have done for us to get us to this point. So, um, Today, I'm just gonna give a brief overview of sort of Maine's sea scallop fishery. Um, obviously, the, you know, the, the presentation that we are gonna be talking about today is, is sort of more focusing on our Maine state fishery, but there are definitely uh, implications from the federal fishery and how they relate to the state fishery. And from a, from a consumer standpoint, um, all Gulf of Maine scallops taste marvelous. And so I think it is important for us to realize that while you might be able to purchase your state of Maine state scallops from the month of December through, you know, March, April, um, come April, you can also purchase Gulf of Maine, Northern Gulf of Maine scallops, and they are just as delicious. So Carla, if you can go to the next slide. For the records that we have at the state level, we do have landings on record since 1950. Um, landings sort of have gone, there we are, the landings have gone up and down since the 1950s. And, and you know, if anything, please take home from this graph that we have a strong history of scalloping in the state of Maine. Um, Carla, if you click one more time, perfect. So keeping in mind when we're looking at this chart, you see a huge peak in around 1980, um, but we've never been back to that peak again. And the arrow that is also on the screen points to the year 2005, where we did have our lowest landings ever. And that sort of decade of starting around 2000 is, is sort of where I would consider where management picked up a little more strongly. Next slide, please. So uh, since 1993, landing started declining, um, not rapidly, but trending downward. And sort of starting around 2000, there was a lot more, I think, um, forward progression about what can we do to help the resource, help the fishery? How do we change management of what we have been doing as a state 
um, that might help with rebuilding or recovery to help you know, increase our landings and ultimately increase the fishery. And so um, during this decade, you know, we saw the size of the shell stock uh, increase from three and a half inches to four inches. Uh, we saw the possession limits. So like what the daily take could be from a harvester actually decrease from 200 pounds to what is now the 15 gallon or 135 pounds. A very pivotal moment that happened in this decade is the Scullab Advisory Council had formed. And so Carla had just mentioned that both David and herself are on this. And it's, it's a, um, a co-management style board that is a mix of harvesters, both dive and drag, scientists and dealers, and an at-large member um, that can have discussions based on what, what issues might we have within the fishery and how might we as a group um, deal with helping those issues, either by forming solutions to management, upgrading drags, choosing harvest levels, choosing calendars. Um, so the SAC formed in 2003, and one of the first things that they did as a group was directly impact how drags are measured or utilized and how they're specified within our regulations. Also during this decade, we experienced our first round of conservation closures, and 13 of these areas, next slide, so these conservation closures would, were put in after much discussion around the 2008 timeframe. And these closures were put in um, up and down the coast. So stemming from uh, you know, a closure that was put in in Casco Bay around Portland um, and various other locations all the way up to the St. Croix uh, at the Canadian border. And this was sort of the first step that DMR had taken to sort of jumpstart recovery um, for the scallop resource. And so the, this is a, a chart that I had found deep in the archives, uh, you know, probably coming from around the 2008, 2009 timeframe. But this shows the original closures that were put in to help with this notion of um, closing certain areas to allow for the stock to recover. So let's just take a pause. So. In Maine, in 2008, 2009, we're having discussions, we're, we're asking ourselves, what can we do as a, as a group, as an agency, as an industry? How can we help scallops recover? Let's put in some closures. Let's see if we can get those babies to grow up. Let's see if we can get the adults to reproduce. Meanwhile, federal scallops. So within the federal scallop fishery, in 2005, the Federal Scholar Fishery implemented a rotational management plan. And um, while this chart is sort of tiny to be looking at on the screen, but you'll see these random boxes and sort of polygons that indicate special areas that were chosen to be areas that are on a rotational management plan. So from a federal perspective, these areas may only be open certain years and they may only have certain amounts of product taken out from them. But if you look along the shoreline um, that borders Maine, New Hampshire and Massachusetts, the blue sort of diagonal hash mark area, that's called the Northern Gulf of Maine management area. It's not under a rotational management plan, but it is adjacent to us as a state. So it boundaries our state waters. And this is also an area that for our harvesters that did not qualify for a upper level limited um, access scallop fishery, they would have a um, general category Northern Gulf of Maine permit. And this season for the NGOM opens in the month of April and that's where your April scallops could come from. So next slide, please. Our own interpretation of a rotational scallop plan. And so starting with the season of 2011, 2012, or well, in the rulemaking of 2012, August of 2012, three scallop zones were created in the state of Maine. And so you have zone one that is west of the red line in Penobscot. You have zone two that is the uh, eastern side of that red line in Penobscot up, on, up to um, Lubeck East Port of the Canadian border. And then you have zone three, which constitutes Cobscoat Bay and then the St. Croix River that also borders the international line up to the Calais Bridge. 
And so those areas that I initially had spoken about that were closed in 2009, they reopened in 2012. And for those zones of one in the West and zone three, way down East, they reopened these closed areas as limited access areas. You could harvest them one day a week. There was a predetermined amount of product that was sort of anticipated to remove from those areas. And then once it was removed, initiate closures in those areas. Now for zone two, it got a little different. So zone two was more similar to the federal system in which a rotational management plan was determined. So in that, in that zone, we took all of the coastline, we chopped it up into uh, sort of discrete polygons, which you can see in the lower figure, there's three different colors. So there's essentially three different seasons or three different years. And those correspond to a rotation schedule. And so certain polygons are open during a season and then certain polygons are closed during a season. And so in the 2020-21 season, top right corner in the blue. So we followed a pattern so that every year new polygons would be open. And so this is an example of what was open for the 2014 2015 season. And this is also what was open this season for 2020-2021. So these seven areas up and down the coast would have been open according to what the zone two dive and drag calendar specified based on recommendations of a harvest schedule from the Scullip Advisory Council. So some of the 2020-2021 season highlights. So, so far this year, this is the end of the third month of the scallop season. Landings have been moderate is what I would say. No, nothing great, but nothing horrible. Um, the price has been very strong. We opened this season with around uh, a $12.75 pound product. And we saw that price increase in the month of January. I've heard reports as high as 1350, um, at least from a dealer perspective. If you're a pedal market, their prices were a little bit higher than that. Um, but it has remained fairly stable and fairly strong for the entire season. Um, reports from harvesters indicate that the uh, legal scallops, so like the actual product that's being harvested, is being found, but it's being found in lower densities. So there's not as much product in smaller spaces. There's product, it's a little bit less, but it also is spread out. So it's spread out sort of in the shoal waters and then it's sort of spread out in the, in the deeper waters as well. Um, meat size and meat quality has been good, but I have not reheard any reports this year of the, um, the unicorn U2s. So when we talk about U10s or U2s, we sort of think about you know 10 scallops per pound two scallops per pound. And so there, haven't, there hasn't been many reports of very, very large scallops this year, but there has been a moderate amount of reports, at least coming to me, um, that folks have been able to find their U10s uh, and sort of separate that out from the other mix of product they've been having. Uh, so typically the run has been about, you know, a 15 count. So 15 scallops per pound. Um, because I don't know what my time frame is right now, because I can't see anything, this was my last slide, and I felt it might be more useful to actually have questions than to keep on going. And I don't know if we're going to have questions individually or if we're just going to wait at the end, but I'll stop there. We're going to wait till the end. Thanks, Melissa. Hello everyone, I'm Amber. I'm gonna go into a little bit about some of the scallop science that we do at the DMR. At first, I'm just gonna begin um, with a brief overview of where we get our information. Um, we predominantly get our information from dredge surveys, but we also get a lot of info from industry input as well through phone interviews. So we make a lot of calls and ask routine questions and we have conversations with the industry. 
Marine Patrol also provides us with information and vessel counts, and that's a good way to understand fishing pressure in different areas. Um, in a normal non-COVID year, I'd be doing ride-alongs with Marine Patrol and boarding boats and asking questions. Um, and in a normal year, I may also be doing some ride-alongs on commercial vessels, but we're not doing that right now. Um, so on this slide on the left, we have the current chart of the state scallop fishing areas. The open areas are those that um, aren't shaded in red. And I've put a link on the bottom just to remind everyone that we do have this on our website. And I've also included some crude labels just to show how the coast is broken up. I know Melissa mentioned that as well, um, but I wanted to put it here since I will be referring to that, um, to these zones later. All right. So for anyone who may not be too familiar with the process, one of our main goals of the dredge surveys is to provide relative abundance estimates of scallops. So we aim to answer questions such as, you know, what's the abundance and density? Where are the scallops located? What's the size distribution of scallops? Um, and then these surveys can also identify areas of interest or concern, um, such as areas with high densities of seed or juvenile scallops. And then all of this information can be shared with management. Now, this work is done in cooperation with local fishers throughout Maine. Um, we conduct the surveys right on Maine fishing boats. And this facilitates conversations and the exchange of information that really benefits the surveys. You know, it provides us with an avenue for outreach to explain our research. And it also means we get valuable area specific information from the captains and crew. So our current survey design allows us to be adaptable to management changes and enables us to step off the boat with a general idea of the health of the stock in an area. And these surveys benefit the industry because it provides management with some information that's essential to having a sustainable fishery. So to meet these objectives, um, we conduct multiple dredge surveys, which I'll briefly describe. Here we go. So one of the surveys we conduct is a spring survey, which normally begins in April. We survey all scallop rotational management areas in zone two that are scheduled to open in the upcoming fishing season. So the figure in the top left is a portion of the scallop area chart. Um, that's zone two. I think a little portion of it is cut off, but all the closed areas are red. So this chart is from mid season of this year and it represents most of the areas where we surveyed in the spring. There are a couple um, emergency closures in there, but all the areas that aren't highlighted in red are where we surveyed. Now this spring survey generally takes about 12 days to complete and it's based on a random stratified survey design. So essentially we take a grid and we lay it over the area and then those grid cells are assigned as either high or low scallop density and then using a statistical program, essentially a random number generator, grid cells are selected at random for each density or strata. Um, then a center point from those grid cells is then set as the station location or where we tow. So the information used to design these surveys comes from harvester reports, past DMR surveys, and then that information is further refined from um, input from industry members from each area. So for the 2020 spring survey, we had to modify our protocols a little bit due to the pandemic, you know, with restrictions in place and everything shutting down. We modified our protocols to somewhat of a port sampling method to allow for six feet of distancing. We wore masks and used PPE, everything like that. Um, so even though there is a pandemic, we haven't stopped working. We've been gathering information however we can in a safe way. Um, the work we would normally do on board during this survey was done on shore on the back of a trailer, like you can see in that picture. Um, so we had room to spread out, you know, it meant we weren't able to collect some of the um, bycatch species information that we normally would if we were on board, but it still enabled us to get valuable information on scallops in the fishing areas before they opened. So with that, let's dig into this year's spring survey just a little bit more. So we collected scallop counts from each tow for density information. Um, we measured scallops using an electronic measuring board like you can see here on the left. We did that to know if there's, you know, harvestable biomass, if there are multiple year classes coming up to replace what will get fished, um, to see if there was a recruitment event, you know, a lot of small scallops, and we can look at that in um, all the areas in zone two. So we also shucked a small portion of scallops from every fourth toe. So we measured shell height, shell depth, and meat weight. Um, and when we do this, it's also a really good opportunity um, to get a general idea of the health of the stock in an area. So here we have some images of some really nice scallop meats. Um, I know they'd look a little better if I was a little better at shucking, but I'll, I'll get there. 
Um, but at this point, we can look for things like parasites, shell blisters, you know, gray stringy meats, things like that. So for today, I'm just going to present a few results from the Englishman Bay or Ilaho Bay rotational area, um, East Filehaven. And that's just to provide examples um, of some of the things that we look at. We're already pr pretty well into the scallop season, so I'm not going to go over the results from each zone two rotation, but I will provide some of the data uh, that we collected during the spring survey, just as examples from areas where we expected there um, to be high fishing pressure. So what you're looking at here is a box plot of mean scallop density. So this is the average density of harvestable size scallops in grams of scallop meat per meter squared. And that's before there was any fishing activity. The two boxes on the left are the Englishman Bay area. And that's the density estimates generated from the 2017 spring survey. And then the next box is from the 2020 spring survey. And that's just the next time the area was open and those two years are side by side for comparison. So the two boxes all the way on the right are from the East Vinyl Haven area, again, from the 2017 survey, and then the rightmost box is from the 2020 survey. The red dot in the center of the box represents the mean or the average, and then the vertical lines are the confidence intervals or the range, and that's to show the variability around the average. So just from these few points, we can already start to identify some potential trends. So let's first look at um, just Englishman Bay, the 2017 survey and the 2020 survey. Um, and there appears to be you know, a potential slight decline in harvestable density. So with this, we would say, let's dig into that more and see what was going on there. So here we have information from the same surveys, the Englishman Bay area from the spring survey of 2017 on the right and 2020 survey results on the, oh, excuse me, 2017 on the left and 2020 survey results on the right. And this is the uh, shell height distribution. So the Y or vertical axis is the density and number of scallops per meter squared. And then the X axis or horizontal axis is the shell height binned by five millimeters. So everything from 50 to 55 millimeters in length is gonna be one dark gray bar. Everything from 55 to 60 millimeters is gonna be another bar. Um, everything to the right of the red dashed line is the harvestable size scallop or illegal scallop. And then that sub area of A2 is just a kind of naming scheme that I used for the spring survey. But, so with this, we get an idea of the size range of scallops in each rotational area. So this area had a pretty good spread um, or range in sizes. And we can tell right away that there was a decline. And that's consistent with what we saw in the box plot on the last slide. So both years had harvestable scallops. You know, there are dark gray bars to the right of those red dotted lines, which is good. Um, but the number of scallops as shown by the height of the bars appears to be less in the 2020 survey. So we can tell another thing is, you know, legal size scallops were caught in 2020. We don't see any massive scallops showing up in the 2020 spring survey. Um, so they were caught in 2017, excuse me. And then we can also tell, um, like track sizes over time. You know, if we see a bump in the chart in the left in the small sizes, we can tell that there were juvenile scallops and we can track them as they grow. Um, and we can track year classes and sizes through time right here. So if you look at the bar just to the left of the red dotted line, the one that is actually touching the red dashed line, that's actually the highest bar in the 2020 survey. And then you can actually look at 2017 and follow those steps down as those scallops grow. So moving on, we also conduct some preseason or fall surveys in November. Uh, this survey is conducted over three days throughout Cobbs Cook Bay or zone three, and then for one day in select areas of zone two. So what we do is we select a subset of stations from the spring survey as a starting point. And the number of stations that we survey is usually just based on logistics, you know, how many stations can we hit in a day um, and funding, things like that. So since the aim of this survey, the preseason survey, is to set a baseline to monitor fishing impacts, um, spring survey locations may be shifted a little bit. Um, on the captain's recommendation to make sure that we're sampling areas where we anticipate high fishing effort. 
So those stations, um, once selected or edited, are then fixed in place to be sampled later throughout the season. So this year, we only had one survey in zone two in the Isle of Hope Bay Rotational Area or East Final Haven. These surveys are cooperative. Um, you know, we work with the industry. So if, you know, you happen to be a scalper on the call today and you're interested in doing research with us, um, feel free to let me know. And yes, that was a shameless plug. Um, but we also have um, in-season surveys that we do, again, cooperative research. Um, and these in-season surveys, as you could guess, are conducted throughout the fishing season. These surveys monitor the scallop populations and uh, fishing removals throughout the season um, using that pre-season survey as a baseline. So we sample fixed stations in the same areas and then track the decline over time. And these are just some of the examples of the data that we collect. Um, you know, some examples of what we do with it and the figures we generate. We can also make things like, you know, shell height to meat weight curves, like you can see here on the top left for East Final Haven. We can make pie charts for area specific densities. Um, the bottom left, there's an example of a pie chart that was actually used in an emergency action this year. Um, we can do growth studies too. We have a scallop tagging study going on in the Lower Penobscot Bay area right now. Um, that's in cooperation with the Hurricane Island Center for Science and Leadership and local scallopers there. Um, so if you happen to be fishing out there uh, next year when that area opens um, and you see a, a scallop or a shell come up with a tag, please retain it and, and read the tag, give us a call and, and give us some info. We'd really appreciate it. Um, lastly, on the last slide, we also do some work with uh, the federal scallop fishery. So I sit on New the New England Fishery Management Council's scallop plan and development team. And we do a survey of federal waters in the Northern Gulf of Maine sometimes. Um, right now we have one going on in cooperation with the University of Maine. So the last survey that we did in this area was in 2019 and we're scheduled to conduct another one uh, this summer. So this is a, you know, a dredge survey. It's focused on Stellwagen Bank, both within and below the NGOM management unit. So where we're gonna be surveying this year is in that figure on the left. It says proposed 2020 survey areas. We're actually gonna be surveying it this summer. Um, and the goal of this survey is to provide up-to-date information on the growth and abundance of a large recruitment event that we saw uh, in the 2019 survey. And you can see that in the shell height distribution figure on the right. And this is to inform future management actions such as closures um, to continue to protect those undersized scallops or to set the tack of the total allowable catch if adequate growth is documented. So, and it'll just further the timeline that we have for survey data in this area. So with that, I'll just say thank you to everyone who participated in the research um, over the years through you know, surveys or interviews. And thank you all for listening on the call today. And thanks to you know, MCCF for, for the opportunity to present um, some of the, what we do here. And I've listed my contact information here just in case anybody wants it. Um, thank you. So um, next up is Captain David Tarr, a, uh, both a scallop dragger and diver from uh, Brooklyn, Maine. All right. So I'm um, David Tarr. I, I've been a commercial fisherman since uh, I was a kid, really. Um, I've been scalloping since the early 80s um, as, as a kid, working on my dad's boat and other people's boats. Um, started full-time uh, fishing in 1986 after I graduated from high school. Um, things were way different back then when we were scalloping. We started November 1st and uh, the season ended April 15th and it was a kind of a wild wild west fishery. I didn't hear Melissa's opening statement so I don't know if she kind of went over this but um, it was a different fishery and it was boom or bust. It oftentimes was quite lucrative but at times it wasn't because it had been over harvested. Um, it was kind of the mentality that if, if I don't go get them, somebody else is going to do it instead. So we, you know, we were all working pretty hard to try and get our share of it. Um, also fished in the drag fishery, smaller rings than what are fished now. They're four inch rings now, as opposed to, I think there might've even been two and a half rings, two and a quarter inch rings. They were much smaller. And what that translates to is a lot more. Trash was brought up off the bottom. And when I say trash, I mean bycatch. And, and that's not to say that bycatch is all trash, but it was uh, it was a dirtier fishery 
Um, it's cleaned up a lot since then. It's more heavily regulated and with these rotational areas, it's a lot less likely to get depleted. Um, these rotational areas are, we use them for the dive fishery and the drag fishery. Um, that is, uh, you know, they, the seasons run at the same time. And at this point, the divers and the draggers are in the same rotations, um, which is a pet peeve of mine. I think, you know, we ought to be kind of separate fisheries and, and on a separate rotation just for safety concerns. And, and also, uh, there's very few divers diving in the state of Maine right now. I want to say the number is somewhere around 30 active scallop divers on the whole coast of Maine. It may be 35, but it's, it's not much more than that. Um, there's probably 70 licenses, so half of those are latent licenses. We see the same thing happen in the uh, in the drag fishery where there's I I want to say there's 300 or four, there's probably 400 active drag licenses. So you you know the scallop fishery as a drag fishery is a lot bigger. Uh, scallop diving is kind of a niche thing. Um, our product as a diver is uh, more desirable to certain restaurants and and consumers. Um, and I certainly, where I do both, I have people that request that it's dive product. Um, I've only been dragging for about five years. The bulk of my career was spent diving. Um, I prefer to go diving for scallops. I really enjoy it. Um, but it's, I'm 54 years old and I'm having a, you know, I'm starting to age out. So this was, we, we had a photographer from MCCF, uh, Tate Yoder, came out aboard the boat and actually shot some drone footage. And then, uh, you know, I, he's using a, a, an underwater camera there. And at one point I was outfitted with an underwater camera and uh, just took it down and was kind of picking up scallops and trying to take a video of it. And I happened to when when this particular video was taken this is a pretty good area that's better than most that's a juvenile scallop um it's kind of one of the advantages to diving is i just don't pick up what i don't want i i pick up legal scallops I, we really don't have to measure many scallops that i that i pick up when i'm diving um whereas the drag we'll we'll see more more juvenile stuff um so that's just a quick overview he's putting together a, a nice video and uh an interview about scallop diving that I think will probably be out in the next couple months and uh, you can look on MCCF to find that. Um, but that's a you know, pretty clean fishery. You can see in the picture to the, to the left, the, the last one there, um, it was just scallops aboard the boat. This is a, this is a picture of a, a toe I actually made Tuesday. And so this is in the lower Penn Bay area between Ilaho and Vinyl Haven. And my stern man there has dumped the drag what's on the deck is what came out of that drag that was about a the drag spent about 12 minutes on bottom and you can see there's like a basket uh and then a little bit more in a basket that's not that's not a terrible tell that's you know we're kind of shooting for that but the thing i want to kind of point out is what you see behind that is most of what was in there for for bycatch which isn't a lot that's really what we're shooting for in the dredge fishery we don't want to see a bunch of stuff come up uh you know or pounding rock piles where we're picking up a bunch of rocks we want scallops that's what we're after and and uh, with that drag with those with those big rings and that mesh in the back is pretty good size most of that stuff goes away uh, you know is, is left on the bottom where it was um, definitely drags impact the bottom more than more than a diver ever would but it's also it's 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 not it's bad it's not as bad as what some people think sometimes you know they just think about it as just tearing up the bottom it definitely impacts the bottom but it's not it's it's not like it leaves a trench down there and, and just drags up a bunch of stuff um that we don't want yeah okay so there's amber <laughs> and she's aboard my boat uh she's to the right this was i think two years ago maybe Maybe it was last year. I can't remember, but the, this I kind of wanted to point this out that it, as as the DMR folks have mentioned, you know, we work hand in hand with them and uh, she was out on the boat measuring what came up in the drag, looking at the bycatch. This drag, this toe obviously had more bycatch in it, more rocks, um, a lot more shells from, uh, you know, that were we call them clappers, they're, they're dead, or they were maybe harvested on the, you know, the opening before, um, little bits of kelp and stuff. Uh, a better toe though, I think that probably had like three baskets in it. 
um, a little closer to the beginning of the season and uh, just kind of shows what would normally come up. But she's just checking all that stuff out, checking the sizes of it and uh, just checking it for quality, how long we're towing and getting an idea of what's out there. Um, trying to trying to keep ahead of, of the curve on whether or not something needs to be closed. And uh, that's really one of the big differences that we have now with the management is the fishermen and the regulators are involved. Um, I don't think the fishermen are always happy with, you know, closures and, and, and things like that, but it's, it's really, it's always made with the, that decision is made with caution for the, for the resource, for the ocean, um, because we don't want to catch the last one and, uh, and they don't want us to catch the last one. So, they will they will close an area before maybe sometimes we as fishermen think that it that it needed to be closed but it's it's really for the sake of the resource and so that when we come back when this area is open again in three years say and hopefully we can do as well as we did in it the last time it was open that's kind of the goal is to is to be very sustainable and and uh, you know be able to keep doing this it doesn't always work um, because the it's a natural population and sometimes we have a better set of uh, seed than than other times and you know ocean temperatures and currents and so much stuff affects it that we can't we can't really keep track of it perfectly um, i'm hoping in the future that the that the state is able to get better data to regulate the fishery um, I think in next year we're up to this, the uh, current plan kind of sunsets, or at least will be open to change. And uh, I expect there to be a push to change some of the rotational areas, um, either shorter times or different times, smaller rotational areas. I don't know. I've heard lots of, lots of ideas, but that all really hinges on how, how good the data is. Uh, the surveys are inadequate and we all know it. I mean, the DMR knows it, the fishermen know it. Uh, it's it, it's really hard to get a snapshot picture from a few surveys of what's really there. It, it is, it's better than nothing, but it's not really quite enough. I, I hope in the future that uh, much like the urchin fishery we have, that we will have uh, monitors on the boat that will let them know when we're out, where we are, how long we're there, whether we be diving or whether we be towing, how much time we're spending in an area, and then they can correlate that maybe in some real time method of what's being taken out of there. I personally sell a lot of my scallops out of the house. The bulk of my stuff goes right out of the house. Um, I sell to a few high end dealers that ship them all over the place. Uh, and they leave here and, and be packed up this afternoon if I've been fishing this morning. And uh, they'll be somewhere across the country tomorrow and on the menu. Um, but a lot of my stuff goes out of the house. And the, the the little hitch to that is, is that the, the DMR can't document what I've done there. I fill up my reports and I send them in, but they can't really uh, know exactly what I had. And uh, so that's a little bit of a problem. And I don't, I don't know how we get past that, but in the future data is going to be key. And, and I do believe that uh, the surveys will figure out a way to do them better. Um, we'll figure out a way to, to have that data available and uh, hopefully keep the fishery going. And another thing in our fishery, which I really approve of, is it's it's not an open access fishery. In other words, you can't just buy a license and go. However, it is open to the point where when a license is relinquished, it, in other words, someone passes away or gives up their license and it's not renewed, um, those go back into a pool that can then be uh, drawn off through a lottery from people who have applied for it. And so those licenses will go back and hopefully go to some new younger fishermen, uh, particularly in the dive fishery. I think it's real important. Um, I, 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 we're we're in a, on a one-to-one -one basis with licenses. So if, if uh, one license goes out, one can come back in. I believe dragging is two to one, but it might be three to one, um, just to restrict that effort slightly. Um, but that that's important. And, uh, I would, I have told many people that I know have applied for these licenses. They're, they're hard to get, 
but uh, many young fishermen, if they get if they get the license, either one, I will take them under my wing and I will show them what I can and help them out and you know keep them safe and um, but also show them how to go about doing this because it's I don't want it to become a lost art and it at least in the dive end of it it really is pretty close if most of us are uh, at least as gray as I am and and uh, and getting grayer all the time and and so we really need some young blood in in that fishery but uh, I don't know did I have any more slides Carla or was that it no that that's it David and I think you ended on a perfect note there yep. um, and so we still have a little bit of time left for the uh, scalp queen aka togue brawn all right so um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to move the slides or not, but at least we'll start with this one, which is good. And can you go like this if you can hear me, guys? Yeah, okay, all right. So I started Down East Day Boat, and um, the original name of the company was Main Day Boat Scallops. It's actually now Down East Day Boat because I wasn't able to trademark Main Day Boat Scallops. And so you'll see a lot of Main Day Boat Scallops on menus now. Um, and as long as they actually are Main Day Boat Scallops, I'm fine with that. Unfortunately, I would say about 98% of them aren't, but there's not much I can do about that since I couldn't trademark the name. So I started my business because most Americans had never actually tasted a fresh, pure scallop and also because Maine fishermen were selling a premium product at a commodity price. And I wanted to change that. So as Melissa mentioned, um, I used to work for the Department of Marine Resources and I became obsessed with uh, trying to bring the scallop fishery back. I worked towards doing that. I was actually the resource management coordinator when we put those closures in place. And after we implemented the closures, which was very controversial, we had to figure out, okay, once we reopen them, how are we gonna regulate them? We can't just open them back up and have them be wiped out. So we held meetings up and down the coast. Carla was present at the majority of those and some additional ones. And at a meeting in Jonesport, Maine, we were talking about lowering the daily catch limit because before I arrived, there was no catch limit. When I arrived, it was we created one that was 200 pounds and we were thinking about lowering it even further. And Morris Alley said, you know, Tog, I wouldn't mind lowering the daily limit if I knew what I was gonna get paid for my catch, but I never know what I'm gonna get paid. And it struck me, why is Morris Alley being paid a price for his scallops that's created or established by the offshore fishery? And it's a completely different product. So let me see if I can advance the slide. Okay, good. So these are New Bedford scallop boats. The 98% uh, of USC scallops come from federal waters, which means three, wa three miles and further off. They're big boats, they stay at sea for a week or more at a time. Uh, all right, so they store their catch in cloth bags buried in ice. You can see that on the right. As the ice melts, it absor it's absorbed by the scallops. They're like sponges. The fishermen love this because they're paid by weight. So even if you are getting a scallop fresh off the boat from a one of these trip boats, there's a good chance that it's a week old scallop and it is really waterlogged. By comparison, this is Morris Alley there on the left with his son Preston. Here in Maine, we are limited to no more than 135 pounds per trip. They can only, they can only go uh, no more than three miles offshore. So they go out and they come right back in within hours. But for decades, because no one had really focused on differentiating just how amazing our scallops are, we were taking those scallops dump and trucking them out of state to be dumped into the traditional supply chain. So mixed in with the stuff from the federal fishery. And I like to say that's like taking a bottle of Dom Perignon and uh, pouring it into a vat of barefoot bubbly. It just does not make sense. We should be getting more money for our product. So I, for about a year, tried to convince some dealers to, to specialize in main day boat scallops and nobody would do it, so I did it. Um, so I started selling to restaurants. They were too much of a pain in the butt because they always wanted to have exactly the same size scallops delivered on the same exact days. And I didn't want to do a whole lot of processing. I just wanted to get the scallops, pour them in bags and ship them out. So I ended up, what I now do is I ship directly to home cooks. This right here though, is a picture of some scallops that I brought to New York City in 2015, I think it was. And I had a variety, I had three different varietals. Oysters, a lot of people understand, have different tastes, different textures, depending on where they grow. Scallops do as well, but you would not know that if all that you've been exposed to are the waterlogged old scallops from the generic federal fishery. So these were from three different areas. And actually, I had 11 different uh, chefs try them. Nine of the 11 
preferred the preferred uh, Troy scallops, which were from Gouldsboro Bay, which also have genetic differentiation, which we could get into, but I only have like four minutes left, so I'm not going to. But there are a lot of reasons why scallops from different areas of the coast have different flavors. And I think that's kind of fun to show people. We have the best scallops in the world in Maine. And look, just one facet of how amazing they are, you can get different flavors. And I try to market that to my customers. I always offer at least two varietals in my shipment. Um, so on this trip, I had a chef that started buying my scallops. He was paying at the time $35 a pound wholesale, which is a whole lot of money. He bought them for a while and then he stopped. And so the guy that I was working with in New York City that was selling for me said, why did you stop? Are they not good enough quality? And the chef said, and this is important, you know, these are the best scallops I've ever had. I know they're worth $35 a pound, but if I'm going to pay $35 a pound, I need to charge $60 a plate. And if I put a $60 steak on my menu, my customers know, wow, that's going to be an amazing steak because they understand that there is that level of differentiation and quality between various types of steak. People don't realize that level of quality exists in scallops. And that's because the traditional seafood supply chain cannot deliver the type of quality that we can deliver here in Maine if we treat our scallops right. So what I do is I get the scallop, I meet the scallop for a fisherman at the boat. I get the scallops, I put them up in bags and I ship them out the next day. Um, I don't have a warehouse that releases, that uh, creates quite a bit of stress, especially in the past couple of weeks when Federal Express has not been able to ship out anything. Um, but I don't have a warehouse where people order and then I fulfill orders. I take orders and then I go out and I get the scallops. And that creates a just a completely different level of quality. And in closing, I just want to read an email. I get emails all the time from people all over the country that say, Tog, I had no idea scallops could taste like this. So I'm going to read this email that I just got a couple days ago. Tog, I just wanted to uh, take a second to hammer home a point I maybe didn't make before because he'd written me a few times. I have bought tons of the best and all that sort of thing. I bought my father-in-law one of those fancy A5 Wagyu ribeyes for Christmas because it was touted as the best beef in the world. Nothing has ever really lived up to the hype or price. Your scallops, however, absolutely smashed the claims in marketing. I thought I was always buying the best when I bought dry scallops at my local fish place, but when I tasted the ones from you for the first time, it was bordering on hard to believe. My wife loves scallops. I've always been middle of the road, but after eating three or four times now, I'm just blown away. I don't think you even do justice on your website. They're so far and above any I've had in both texture and flavor. And then he went on to describe how he prepares them. So I know that we're uh, running low on time and people might have questions, but basically we need to do a better job here in Maine of educating customers from outside Maine primarily just how amazing our seafood is. Um, one other story just to illustrate this is that I have always shipped Maine scallops, but my customers want seafood in the summer as well now. And so I experimented and I, I worked with a day boat fisherman, uh, not one of those trip boats, but a smaller fisherman out of Provincetown last summer. And I told him what I wanted. And he's like, oh, I can do that. Um, and he, we here in Maine, we put our scallops in five gallon buckets. So they'd never come into contact with the ice. And that's one of the reasons that they stay so pristine. They're not gonna absorb water. He said, Tog, I can't put them in five gallon buckets because summer scallops aren't the same as, as winter scallops that you're used to. But what I could do is what I used to do years ago for some company that wanted ultra dry scallops. So he took the cloth bags, he put them in the cloth bags, and then he put the cloth bags in a plastic bag and then buried in the ice. And that was something that created a, a quality very similar to what I am used to. And that just goes to show you that even that day boat fisherman from the federal fishery had to do this something special and weird in order to give me the quality that I'm looking for. People are not doing this with scallops, which is sad because it means that people are not able to taste what scallops are supposed to taste like, but it's good because it's an opportunity for us to really get better at giving our scallops the respect that they deserve here in Maine. So anyone that has any questions, feel free to email me or call me. I love talking about scallops, but I will end it there. I'm going to mute myself. Oh, uh, downeastdayboat.com if you want to have my scallop shipped. Great. Thank you, Tog. Uh, just what we expected to hear from you. So that's great. <laughs> um, so I know we're really right up against our 130, but I wanted to uh, entertain a few questions. I know that we've been answering some here and there and typed into the Q&A, but um, let's go a few minutes into some questions. Thank you, speakers, for your, your information and participating. I see anything coming in in the chat? Any more questions? Why is the license ratio different for divers? Um, do you want to take that, David? 
Sure. Uh, well, you know why I think it is is because uh, there are only 70 or so dive licenses in the whole state. Now, it's a big state. Um, so going one to one, uh, that allowed that number to stay the same. The uh, drag licenses, and maybe Melissa will answer that, but I think there are maybe seven or 800 licenses um, out there. They're not all used. Um, so it was just felt that we could reduce that number and it would be better for the fishery um, in the long run. Okay. okay. Thanks, David. Um, <clears throat> So Lorraine wanted us to talk about cultivating scallops. We don't have any growers here, but there is a small um, kind of a niche, two or three license hold or lease holders are growing scallops in, in Maine. And it's becoming a, something that people are investing in more and more as research develops. And let's see another, what's the best oil to use to cook scallops? <laughs> Go ahead, Tog. <laughs> And I'm sorry, I was just trying to answer a couple questions and it just went away. Um, you don't want to use a whole lot of oil. I like to get a cast iron pan. You can go to my website actually and I have information about how to get a perfect sear on a scallop, but you want to use a cast iron pan and just use um, something with a high smoking point. So grapeseed oil, olive oil, ghee, but just a little bit because if you put a lot of oil on it, it's going to splatter if you have it at that high temp that you want. Really, you could even just put a little bit on and then wipe it with a paper towel. That's how I like to do it. Okay, thank you. And then there's another one for you, Tobe. How do you, oh, you already answered it. Okay. Um, I didn't, I tried to answer it, but I couldn't. Um, someone wanted to know how I select which fishermen I'm going to work with. Um, I got to know quite all, not all the fishermen, but a good bunch of fishermen while I was working at DMR. And then I bought from a number of them and I know which ones shuck cleanly and which ones don't. As a matter of fact, my mother once said, I wanna marry Alex Todd because he produces really clean scallops. Um, so right now I'm buying from, just gonna start buying from Alex again next week. I've been buying from James West. Some of my customers have requested James West scallops because he gets nice big scallops. Um, I've been buying from Kristen Porter. Basically, I don't deal with people that I know are rule breakers um, and I don't deal with people that don't shuck cleanly. Um, Fortunately, because I pay a higher price to the guys, I'm able to find a good set of guys that want to work with me. Okay, thank you, Tog. Um, we've got quite a few cultivating questions here. Alex, you had asked how long it takes for a legal scallop to grow. You wanna take that, Amber? Yeah, sure. I think um, I think it was answered in the comments as well, and I think that's about right. It generally takes um, probably about four years. Um, we, um, you know, UMaine has a, an aging study going on right now. Um, we've got other growth curves for the coast, but um, I'd say like four years is probably a good estimate for the low end of what would be a legal size. Okay, thank you. I'll touch on the cultivating into that just a little bit. I'm not, I, I have, I've not cultivated scallops. I have, however, collected spat, which is how that kind of starts. Um, it is a different thing than what, what we do as commercial fishermen. Obviously they grow them. Um, they're sold much smaller, generally uh, maybe two to two and a half inches. And they're for, for a cuisine where they're sold whole, which as, uh, natural, a wild harvester, we're not allowed to bring those scallops in whole. So we cannot sell the, the entrails and the, what goes along, which the French would say we throw the best part overboard. Um, the reason we can't is because that can very easily have red tide in it. The meat itself will, will not have red tide in it, but all of the other stuff can. So when scallops are cultivated, they're cultivated in sites where they know the water is not, doesn't have red tide, it's tested. And uh, so there's, kind of a specialized market, but there are quite a few people now interested in it and trying to uh, to get that market going as well. Yeah, the um, the reproductive organs of scallops can have like paralytic shellfish poisoning and things. So we just kind of tend to stay, stay to that adductor muscle. But um, I also want to mention too that tagging study in Penn Bay that I mentioned, um, a portion of scallops that we tagged are also um, going to be raised um, in an aquaculture facility on Hurricane Island. 
Um, so we aren't doing, um, aging isn't currently a part of that, you know, research proposal, but we are going to be doing a growth study to hopefully get some good comparisons about um, wild scallop growth versus, um, you know, aquaculture scallops. So hopefully we'll have some more information to add to that soon as well. Okay, thank you. A couple more questions. Um, what is the price premium for main scallops compared with New Bedford? Do you know off the top of your head, Tog? I was just typing an answer and I'll just say it now. Not nearly <laughs> as much as it should be. Um, you know, actually in New Bedford, so Maine guys aren't generally taking their stuff down to New Bedford, they're selling it here. But in New Bedford, when the day boats come in, they will sometimes get paid less than the trip boats because the entire industry is set up to deal with thousands of pounds coming off the boat at a time. So it's a pain in the ass for these guys to deal with just 600 pounds. Um, I think in general, you're going to get maybe a dollar or two a pound higher for the, the day boat catch than uh, the trip boat catch, but that's if you're lucky. It's just, it's crazy. The industry is so dominated by these trip boats uh, and they're making money doing what they're doing. We have not done a good enough job of differentiating our, our main catch. So I, I pay a lot more than that, um, but we, we're nowhere near where we should be. So just to, to add to that, Prior to our season starting in December for Maine, there were there was a 50,000 pound dump of federal scallops to the New, New Bedford auction, uh, I think in the month of November. And the product had come from the Mid-Atlantic and they were what we would consider a, a, a 20 count run. And they got $12 a pound. And getting $12 a pound for a 20 count run of Mid-Atlantic scallops is phenomenal from that perspective. Um, and so when I, had, when I had heard that news from other harvesters, I sort of had an anticipation that our product from Maine would be around at least the $12 mark. And sure enough, we started at $12.75 and we kept on increasing because ours tastes better, of course. I'll also say that the markets for scallops are, are quite varied. I, like I said, I sell a lot. Um, direct to the consumer, but I also sell into some uh, higher end markets, much like Tog does. I mean, there's there's quite a few people that actually buy scallops and ship them all over the place. Um, and some of those prices, if we if we are separating them out, I, mean, I easily I can sell all of my ten count stuff right now for sixteen dollars a pound, and all of my fifteen counts for for uh, fourteen dollars a pound. And that's just I mean, they'll come to the house and pick them up and and take them for that. And actually, I sell them out of the house. A little cheaper than that. I probably shouldn't be, but that's just kind of, I based it off, you know, I kind of average the price up because when I'm selling them out of the house, I don't, I don't uh, sort them. And so I'm just taking the kind of the average price that that's available to me, but the prices are very varied. And actually it's sometimes if people send them to New Bedford, I know, I know boats that were sending scallops to New Bedford and getting close to $20 a pound a couple of weeks ago. So you you never really know when they go on to an auction like that. Thank you, David. I'm going to take, um, I think, just two more questions. And uh, David, there is someone here, I don't know if you can see, who wrote to you specifically about your compressor and your tanks. I don't know if you could, if you would mind typing in an answer to them, uh, please. And then we've got a question about, are divers ever used for surveys? And um, I think that's to Amber, but then also, could they be incorporated to do an annual habitat survey, which is contributing a little bit more to like ecosystem-based management approaches? And I think to date, divers have been used for kind of small, specialized, um, experimental, ecological experimental work. But um, Amber, I don't know if you wanna contribute to that. Sure. Yeah, so we did um, some dredge efficiency studies with our uh, survey drags and we used divers for that um, to understand, um, yeah, essentially, you know, how, how efficient our, our, our drags were that we were using. Um, so that information is really important when we're, when we're looking at our density estimates. Um, there is definitely potential to do other research with divers. Right now, we don't have any current plans to incorporate diving into the surveys. Um, and I can look into, you know, some of the history of, of what the DMR has done so far. But, but right now, I know we've, we've definitely used diving for our dredge efficiency work. And there are studies from, you know, other institutions that are using um, divers to yeah, look at um, 
impacts of different types of gear on bottom or substrate. Okay, thanks, Amber. And then um, a last question says, um, David mentioned that there's a new scallop plan or uh, to be developed or basically a review and um, the current rotational management is set to sunset. What are the preparations going on now to, to address this and to plan moving forward? I think that's for you, Melissa. I'll take that one. So the uh, right now we are currently in our ninth season uh, on what is what or what has been the 10 year plan that was in the regulation. And so the 2021 2022 uh, season coming up this coming December will be the 10th and final uh, documented year under the rotational management plan. And so the intent of the department at this point in time is to, you know, fully assess or like do our best to assess how it has worked or not worked in the last 10 years. And, and as David has mentioned, there's, there's multiple opinions about what tweaks could be done, be it either bigger areas, smaller areas, different areas, um, more days, less days, uh, differences between, um, you know, having, having the, the bays or the, the rivers or that sort of inside um, area of the, of the waters be treated maybe differently than what would be considered like exposed or, or outer shore areas. And so that sort of relates to how currents and water moves in regards to recruitment. And so as David also had mentioned too, you know, everything hinges on recruitment and it hinges on, you know, we have to do our best to either leave enough of the legal product behind so that they can reproduce more um, or just be blessed with mother nature wanting to give us a huge seed set. And, and I was talking to somebody today earlier on the phone that, you know, I don't think that we have a great handle on the frequency and the peaks and valleys of recruitment. So all of this information, I think, needs to be sort of reevaluated and rediscussed and to determine how best do we move forward, especially in the climate of the environment is changing and our recruitment has definitely not been fantastic in the last couple of years. Okay, thank you, Melissa. And apparently I did miss one hand raise. This is the final question. Uh, Sally Littlefield, do you have a question you wanted to voice? And I think, do I have to unmute you? Ask to unmute. I don't know how to unmute you. Remove. I don't know. All I have is ask to unmute. Tate, do you know how to do this? Yeah, I'm asking her to unmute, but I'm not sure if we can do that from our end. Oh, she just wrote, she's not on a microphone. So do you have a question you want to type, Sally? I don't see anything coming in. Okay. You answered lots. Okay. All right. So thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you everyone for staying a few minutes over and um, thank our panelists, uh, Tog and Melissa and Amber and David. And um, stay tuned for, I think our next, um, our next in the series is about our Sentinel survey fishery and which uh, it is, assessing ground fish abundances in eastern Maine. And um, so again, also I wanted to mention that David Tarr is, he, he holds many hats, but he's also one of our board members here at MCCF, just joined this year. So thanks again. Thank you all. Have a wonderful Friday afternoon and enjoy some of this weather. <laughs> Bye, everybody.